Thank you, members. Questions without notice, I call the Leader of the Opposition. Uh, thank you, Mr Speaker. My question is to the Minister for Children and Young People. Minister, on Monday 7 March, the Federal Government released the Education and Care Services National Regulations Exposure Draft. Minister, I draw your attention to Part 6, Policies, Procedures and Programs, Division 4, Relationships with Children. And in particular, I draw your attention to 861A, Protection from Inappropriate Activities or Treatment. And I quote, Children being educated and cared for by the service are not required to undertake activities that are inappropriate, having regard to each child's family and cultural values, age and physical and intellectual development. Minister, it's been reported that this will affect the ability of centres to have an Easter egg hunt and celebrate Christmas. The WA Minister for Community Services, Robin McSweeney, has vowed to reject the proposed national laws, labelling it as political correctness gone mad and is hoping the federal government gets a common sense base before it is adopted over there. They have foreshadowed that if the federal government does not, they will draft their own corresponding legislation. Minister, do you support this proposed law in its current form? Minister Birch. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Look, I'm aware that there has been some discussion about some elements of the regulation and and um, some misinformation being put through the media, which suggests that centres uh, can't allow children to participate in Easter egg hunts or decorating Christmas trees. It's certainly not my understanding, and I think the Federal Minister has come out and dismissed those uh, accusations or commentary as well. Uh, we have centres that are already have in place uh, a framework, a policy, a mindset that ensures that all children are able to participate or should they not want to participate in a particular activity, it is their right to do so, and they will be supported to engage in other learning activities within the centre. Mr Zeldra, supplementary. Minister, will you be drafting your own corresponding legislation if the federal government does not get a common sense base? Minister Birch. Uh, look, the regulations are still being actively uh, discussed and, uh, across the sector. There is a common sense approach. I have faith in the regulations, but I will keep an eye and ear to uh, how I can further support the sector here in the ACT. Yes, Mrs Dunn. So the expression activities that are inappropriate is not defined in the regulations. Can you advise the Assembly as to your understanding of its meaning and how it would be interpreted in the, the context of day-to-day -day operations of childcare in the Territory? Minister Birch. Um, thank you, uh, Mr Speaker, and I thank Ms Dunn for uh, trawling through the regulations, the draft regulations and the bill. The currently in the ACT, there are already, as I've said, systems and approaches in place across centres that allows the centres to develop a curriculum, a framework, an activity set that allows children to participate in what we here in Australia know regularly comes in a calendar. They, Easter, Christmas, we also celebrate Chinese New Year at the centre. Hold on, Ms Birch, one moment. Thank you. Um, it was a very specific question about the meaning of activities that are inappropriate uh, and asking for the minister's understanding of what that is. And I'd ask you to direct her to be directly relevant to the question. Uh, minister Birch, if you'd like to perhaps help Mr Sizelja with the matter after as well. I would say that appropriate activity inclu includes an a Easter egg hunt and decorating a Christmas tree. Thank you. Minister Dana, supplementary. Minister, have any service providers or members of the public expressed concerns with you about this? And if so, how have you responded to their concerns? Minister Birch. Um, look, there's been nothing come to my office, but I'm aware that uh, the, the, the sector is actively engaged with the community, with the childcare sector in its discussions about the regulations. Nothing's come to my office that indicate that the sector here aren't clear in their mind about what's an appropriate activity. Ms Hunter, a question without notice. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Uh, my question is to the Minister for Health. Minister, as you know, midwives were granted Medicare, Medicare eligibility in November 2010. The ACT has one Medicare eligible midwife with six others pending. Medicare eligible midwives are required to obtain either a collaborative agreement or an arrangement in order to practice. They also need clinical privileges to provide care within the hospital system. Minister, can you outline what steps ACT Health has taken to enable collaborative arrangements and clinical privileges for Medicare eligible midwives? 
Ms. Uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker. Uh, and this is something that uh, the government is having ongoing discussions with uh, the Greens around. I haven't got a, an update um, as of today, but I can say that I have sought advice on how to implement um, access to clinical privileges for eligible midwives should they want it. I'm not aware, I'm not aware of anyone that has sought to, to gain clinical privileges um, at a, through ACT Health, but I might be corrected on that. I'm, I'm personally not aware. But uh, once the issue was raised with me, I think by Ms Bresnan, in a meeting I had with her, I have sought um, advice on how we can facilitate that and whether there has been interest in it and whether, you know, and we have to deal with that and whether there are any concerns around it. Supplementary, Ms Hunter. The ACT can currently contract a Medicare eligible midwife and can, compl and can claim Medicare payments. Minister for Health. Oh, sorry, I just missed the first part of the question. Can I explain yes, how they can? Uh, can, you, can you explain how the women of the ACT, sorry, who currently contract a Medicare eligible midwife, uh, how they can claim Medicare payments? I'll have to take that on notice. It, I must say it isn't something that we manage on a day-to-day -day basis because uh, it's through the, really through the private health system. Um, you know, in terms of women accessing midwifery care through ACT Health, that is something that ACT Health manages. But I can certainly take some more advice on it. Ms Hunter. Yes, Ms President. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Uh, Minister, will you direct senior obstetric staff to respond to Medicare eligible midwives when communicating mandatory care plans that are part of their insurance requirements? Minister for Health. Uh, thank you. Look, I, I don't... I don't ever direct uh, senior medical staff to do anything um, because, um, you know, it's not my... Well, I don't, I don't think you can... I, can, I don't think you can take that approach um, to this issue, but, look, if, if there is eligibility and there are, is a midwife interested and in order to gain, um, you know, the appropriate supports through Medicare, they need to have pr clinical privileges through ACT Health, then I think we need to look seriously at how we deliver that. But I'm not going to say that it's going to be easy or that there is going to be broad support for it, because I know um, the medical profession, um, you know, have had some concerns around um, independent midwives and their practice, and also the risk or, or what they see as the risks of... Um, you know, working collaboratively uh, in a professional relationship where they don't have a great deal of control or say. And I think those are legitimate um, issues, but I have asked Health uh, for advice around how we facilitate um, a process where women, uh, uh, independent midwives, I should say women, where independent midwives can apply for clinical privileges at Canberra Hospital. Uh, yes, Mr Hanson. So given that the government advised that you'd be uh, absent from question time, the opposition prepared no questions, when did the government advise the Greens that you would be present at question time? The question is uh, actually not related to the initial question. I'm sorry questions. to have ruined, yeah. of sorry to have ruined your question. I can answer it just for the sake the question of, is out of, order. of, of um, cancelling the conspiracy, but we didn't... Well, why don't you ask? <laughs> order. Order. The question without notice, Mr Dospot. Thank you, Mr Speaker. My question is to the Minister for Children and Young People. Minister, on Monday, 7 March, the Federal Government released the Education and Care Services National Regulations Exposure Draft. Minister, I draw your attention to Part 6 Policies, Procedure and Programs, Division 4 Relationships with Children. And in particular, I draw your attention to Section 86.1b. In protection from inappropriate activities or treatment, and I quote, a child being educated and cared for by the service is not separated from other children for any reason other than illness or an accident. Minister, this will end the ability of workers to use a time out as a means of behaviour management in the centres. Minister, do you support this proposed regulation? If so, what child behavioural patterns have you considered in coming to that view? Minister Birch. Um, thank you, Mr Speaker, and I thank Mr Dospot for his question and um, for reading uh, some inf misinformation that has been uh, put into media. Uh, the, the, well, the regulation services, uh, the regulator of services need to make sure that children are safe in their learning development and supported in education and share services. The draft regulations do not include a prescriptive definition of 
children being separated. The outcome is the child is Order. not removed or isolated from other children and staff on an ongoing basis. The regulation, the regulation, the regulation. Sorry about that, Mr. Speaker. I require that each child is given a positive guidance um, and encouragement towards acceptable behaviour. I go to say also that the existing uh, childcare services standards already address this issue within a behavioural guidance context. Supplementary, Mr. Dosport. Research underpins this regulation and its penalty consequences. And will you table that research by the close of business today? Minister Birch. Um, it would be extensive research that underpins this new framework. This is education Order. and care national law. The, uh, the, the, the research underpinned the bill that was put through the Victorian Government back in October. It underpins the bills that are being introduced in each state and territory. So I, well, I would direct them one to multiple websites. I would do. I will bring a list what I can. But if you want me to truck in, truck in, um, I am not prepared to do that. Uh, members of the opposition, your colleague is seeking the floor. Mrs. Dunn, you have a supplementary question. Minister, what behavioural guidance context, as you referred to it, is used to determine behaviour management? In, in childcare centres as they currently operate in the ACT and is timeout uh, provisions allowed? Minister Birch. Thank you. Uh, look, it's my, it's my understanding that within uh, the current standards and what will be reflected in the new standards is that the services here maintain their compliance with the standards by not isolating children as a strategy to manage a children's behaviours. Children are in services to interact with other children. And early childhood professionals and good practice means that children should not be separated or isolated for reasons other than their own health or to assist in stopping a spread of infectious disease. Now, the professionals, the childcare workers here in the ACT are skilled at managing children's behaviour. Sometimes children have expressed uh, difficult behaviour. So it's not unusual for um, professionals to manage uh, that in their day-to-day -day environment within centres. Yes, Mr Hargraves. Thanks very much. My uh, supplementary to the Minister is what experience in, in your former life in childcare would actually enable you to be able to know the vagaries and the difficulties facing childcare centres in behavioural issues in children? Minister Birch. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Mr Hargraves, and thank you, Mr Speaker, for that question. Uh, look, there are, are fantastic childcare professionals here in the ACT that care for children each and every day of the week, and they provide a fantastic service and support to Canberra families. Um, yes, I did own and operate a childcare centre, but as a parent, I also have experience in managing dif difficult behaviours, as I'm sure every families do, uh, with their Thank children. We all are aware of uh, the terrible twos. Uh, that's within a family context, but it is also within a service context. The regulations provide clear guidance. Our professional childcare sector here in the ACT are well aware, are well aware of their standards and are very comfortable with its implementation. Question without notice, Ms Lakuta. My question is to the Minister for TAMS and concerns the Asian honeybee. Minister, as the ACT's representative to the Primary Industries Ministerial Council, are you aware of the extensive scientific evidence presented to the recent Senate inquiry that the Asian honeybee can have serious implications on cold temperate climates like Canberra's, especially on biodiversity and the environment? Chief Minister. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Uh, I thank Ms Lakuta for the uh, question. Uh, thank you, Ms Lakuta. Ms Lakuta, I am aware of the risk which the Asian honeybee uh, represents, uh, most particularly uh, to, uh, um, I think, uh, uh, fauna within Australia. Um, it's been a very difficult issue. It's been problematic. It's been an issue that has uh, been uh, con considered at some length thank by... You, by most particularly agriculture ministers from around Australia, the decision has been taken, and I'm, I, I, I'm sure you're aware that the decision uh, has been taken, that the, uh, the decision has been taken that uh, an eradication program uh, is not feasible. Uh, whilst, uh, whilst there is a, a recognition always of the implications 
uh, for native uh, uh, fauna and indeed for, for our environment when uh, exotic species are introduced or find their way into Australia and the Asian honeybee uh, is one such exotic um, bee that uh, has established in Australia. Uh, it, is a, an, it is a matter of uh, significant, concern, significant concern, most particularly the rural sector, uh, based on scientific advice. Uh, the decision has been taken that it is not practical or possible uh, to uh, seek to contain, through a structured eradication program, the Asian honeybee. It's a matter of enormous regret, uh, but the advice that has been accepted by governments, all governments across Australia, uh, is that uh, the prospects of successfully combating the incursion of uh, Asian honeybees, that there is no prospect uh, of... Uh, the recent Senate inquiry. Uh, if the Minister could comment on that. Chief Minister. Oh, thank you, Mr Speaker. I've uh, concluded my answer. Just before you proceed, Ms Lakuta, for members of the Opposition, I find your string of derisory comments both unparliamentary and disorderly and not becoming on this place. I'd ask you to desist from it. Ms Lakuta, you have a supplementary question. Thank you. Uh, what review have you done of the economic, social and environmental impacts of the Asian honeybee that could have on the ACT and Australia, particularly since the ACT is in your decision to vote again, to defund the eradication program? Chief Minister. Thank you, Mr Speaker. I'll take the question on notice. Yes, Ms Brisbane. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Will the ACT government now reverse its position and vote to fund the Asian honeybee eradication program at the upcoming primary industry ministerial council meeting? Chief Minister. Thank you, Mr Speaker. No. Further questions without notice? Mr. Without notice, Mr Speaker. My question is to the Minister for Children and Young People. Minister, on Thursday, the 24th of March, you appeared on the 666 ABC morning radio program. You were questioned about criticism of the infrastructure grants and the fact that you are not doing enough to address the immediate problem of staff shortages. Your response was, and I will quote, Ah, well, the ratios come into effect in 2012. Um, the qualification requirements attached to staff come in effect in 2012, so 2012 in my calendar head hits me before 2014. That is why we are moving on the infrastructure grants first and foremost. Minister, 52 temporary exemptions from childcare standards were granted in 2009. 71 were granted in 2010. Mm. Already 12 have been granted so far this year. Minister, how will the implementation of the National Quality Framework, which you introduced into the Assembly this morning, alleviate the difficulty that childcare centres are experiencing in recruiting staff? Minister Birch. Thank you, uh, Mr Speaker, and I thank Mr uh, Hanson for his question. Uh, we have the bill come, will come in effect. We've tabled the bill. The new regulations come in effect for staff ratios in January of next year and for qualifications for 2014. Uh, the question about supporting the sector around workforce recruitment is an ongoing challenge, not only in the ACT but across Australia. You're right, I'm looking at uh, the things that need to be done uh, now, and that is also about supporting sector to meet the ratios, which is why we've put in $10,000 grants to support the community sector. Should they have building requirements, should they have design and building plans to do, should they require some internal modifications that will support them in that? As far as workforce, we work hand in hand with the sector. The Children's Services Forum, uh, the Children's Services Sector know that this is an ongoing battle. Uh, strangely enough, uh, the portable long service leave we consider to be a, a recruitment and retention strategy for the sector. Those opposite have no interest in supporting the sector with a portable long service leave. As far as ongoing support and recruitment, it is about training. Uh, we mentioned yesterday about we mentioned yesterday about the opportunities through CIT, and you see we also spoke about RPLing. This is just part of the ongoing strategy that this government has about supporting the sector. Supplementary, Mr. Hanson. Mr. Is there a critical shortage of skilled childcare workers which must be addressed now, not when your calendar head hits you in 2014? And if yes, what are you doing about it now in 2011? Minister Birch. 
Um, thank you. Well, what we've done is worked with the sector on developing a, um, a postcard, a promotional material about a career in workforce. We also have activities uh, where at career. Uh, at career events, and we also promote childcare sector as a valuable and uh, professional place to work. Yes, Mrs. Dunn. Minister, what have you done to satisfy yourself that staff shortages uh, that staff shortages will not be a problem when your calendar head hits you in 2014? Minister Birch. Well, I will continue working with the sector and do what I can to facili facilitate their workforce strategies. Yes, Mrs. Dunn. Minister, when will you actually listen to the community and act upon their concerns about skill shortages? <laughs> Minister Birch. Uh, I do listen to the community. I do listen to them regularly, and I do what I can as I can, which is why we've brought in uh, the grants just recently. But going about go, going to some of the misinformation and misunderstanding on this uh, from those opposite, I was my attention was drawn to a City News article in January of last year. Um, where Miss Dunn, um, however, and I cannot quote from this, Mr. Speaker, uh, community services spokesperson Vicky Dunn says the new national quali quality framework will inevitably result in increases in childcare fees. From the discussion my office has had with the Childcare Alliance, a peak body for the childcare operators, fees will increase by up to $22 Point of a day. Point Just of reducing order. the care of. Uh, Miss Birch, one moment, please stop the clocks. Thank you. Minister, I asked a question about staff shortages. Mm -hmm. Ms Birch is, try, is, is trying to, to switch to another topic which is, she's more comfortable with, but the question was about staff shortages, not about the cost of childcare, and the Minister needs to answer the question, when is she going to listen to the community yeah, yeah. about their concerns about staff shortages? You'll quote yes. down more On the point of order, I'm actually not sure where Ms Birch is going with this quote. Oh. But we'll see, thank Ms Birch. But let's keep the question in just reading it to fill in the time. Uh, Lisa's thank quote thank makes you, sense. Mr. Um, well, just reducing the carer to children ratio from one to eight to one to five would mean an increase of cost of nearly uh, 40 per cent, and that doesn't count for the cost of possible underutilisation of capacity. Now, what that goes to show is that if you have indeed been listening to the sector, Mrs. Dunn, you would know that we already meet the one to five ratios. So you are misinformed, you continue to be misinformed and you continue to spread it here. Mr Smith, a question without notice. Indeed, Mr Speaker. Mr Speaker, my question is the Minister for Police and Emergency Services. Minister, as a result of a severe storm event at Canberra Airport on 3 December 2010, the new headquarters for the Emergency Services Agency was flooded. Various operations undertaken by the agency had to be transferred temporarily to other premises. Minister, have all functions which were relocated from the new headquarters been returned to Fairburn? If not, why not? Yeah, yeah. Minister Corbell. <coughs> uh, thank you, Mr Speaker, and I thank Mr Smith for the question. The operations of the ESA's 000 call-taking centre, or the ComSEN as it is known, uh, are still continuing to operate from premises at Curtin. Uh, the, reason, the reason for this, Mr Speaker, uh, is... Uh, Several fold. First of all, the ESA Commissioner has taken the decision that it would be unwise to relocate the ComSEN during the period of the bushfire season uh, and that it would be most appropriate to make the, make the transition back to uh, the ESA headquarters in Fishwick following the completion of the bushfire season. Secondly, uh, Mr Speaker, the bushfire season finished three days ago, Mr Smith, or what is it, six days ago. Um, secondly, uh, Mr Speaker, uh, the resolution of outstanding matters with the airport group in relation to repair of the building is ongoing, as is the finalisation of uh, responsibilities in terms of insurance is ongoing. Uh, and for those reasons, relocation has not yet occurred. I can assure members uh, that the operation of the ComSEN has been uh, very reliable and constant throughout that period, uh, and the, the transition and the return to Fishwick will happen uh, in an orderly and considered manner once uh, outstanding issues are resolved. Now, your supplementary question, Mr. Speaker. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Minister, what action has been taken since the storm to ensure that there is no repeat of the flooding of the headquarters of the Emergency Services Agency? 
Minister Corbell. Uh, thank you, Mr Speaker. And extensive steps have been taken uh, to prevent a reoccurrence uh, of this uh, failure. Uh, the failure occurred because of a very significant rainfall event. In fact, uh, a rainfall event that is estimated by the Canberra Airport Group uh, to be a one in 100 year rainfall event. Uh, the Canberra Airport Group has undertaken a range of actions to prevent water from entering the building, uh, as is their obligation as the owner uh, of the premises and the grounds surrounding the building. Uh, they have constructed a series of new works uh, which are designed to prevent a reoccurrence of that flooding event, uh, including additional drainage uh, and additional uh, other engineering works uh, to ensure uh, that a reoccurrence of the event um, is uh, eliminated to the greatest extent practicable. Supplementary, Mr Sizildjian. Uh, yeah, Minister, what has been the cost of any remedial action at the Fair Fairburn headquarters and is the total cost of any measures the responsibility of the ACT? Minister Corbell. Uh, there are a range of costs and costs are expected to be shared uh, between the Territory and the Capital Airport Group uh, in relation to uh, obviously, the Capital Airport Group is incurring all of the costs associated with remediation and, and additional engineering works surrounding the building uh, on grounds that they own and, in the, and external to the building. Issues in relation to damage within the building uh, is being resolved through the Territory's insurance uh, arrangements and any uh, requirement to uh, engage with the Capital Airport Group in relation to those insurance arrangements. Uh, the, exact, the exact cost has not been determined. Insurance uh, matters are ongoing. Supplementary, Mr Sizelja. Uh, yeah, what contingency plans exist for maintaining emergency services in the event of problems at the Fairburn headquarters? Uh, Minister Corbell. Well, Mr Speaker, the obvious contingency in relation to the transfer from Curtin to Fishwick uh, was that the Curtin uh, facility remained available, and indeed that is what the Territory has drawn upon. Uh, in the context of future arrangements, and particularly once the Curtin site is fully decommissioned, uh, the ESA has always had as its contingency the provision uh, to be able to stand up a capacity uh, at the, uh, the um, Winchester Police Centre uh, through their triple zero call taking centre, and provision is made in the infrastructure at that facility to stand up a capacity at the Winchester Police Centre in the event of a failure at Fishwick. Uh, following this incident, the ESA is also exploring whether it is appropriate to retain capacity at Curtin uh, in the longer term, uh, and that is a matter that is under ongoing consideration. Mr President, a question without notice. The question is to the Minister for Health and concerns preventative health and life expectancies. Minister, the ACT Health Council has stated that if current trends in obesity continue, the life expectancy of ACT people would decrease. The recently released Picture the Future Healthcare 2030 report also suggests that three in four Australians will be overweight or obese in 2030 if current trends continue. Minister, what is the ACT government's response to the warning for the first, that for the first time in many generations, life expectancies will go backwards? Minister for Health. Thank you, uh, Mr Speaker, and I thank Ms President for the question. Uh, look, um, what I've asked Health to do in response to um, not only that report but in relation to some, um, I think, other data that we're getting through um, a, a range of tests that's done across government, including through education but also through the Chief Health Officer's report, which is all indicating that lifestyle-related factors are, are going to increase um, in terms of the burden on the health system and, and diet and lack of physical exercise, um, poor nutrition and, and lack of appropriate amounts of exercise are leading contributors to that. Um, what I've asked health to do is to go back and look at all the programs uh, where we're providing our preventative health uh, messages and, we're, and we've, we've indeed in the last year started an, another, a number of, of programs in this area to look that to look to make sure that we're targeting the messages in the right places. And I think this is ongoing discussion about whether a general sort of broad-based population approach applies or whether we actually get down to um, dealing with particular population groups across the community where we're seeing 
um, no improvements or, in fact, deterioration in some of the um, in some of the health message um, areas, uh, and that um, the area in um, the public health area in ACT Health, led by the chief health officer, is doing that work and providing that advice to me. I'm I'm worried that um, you know here in the ACT, to a large extent, and compared to national indicators, that we we do pretty well in terms of. Um, uh, our overall health, uh, but I am increasingly concerned that we're not putting enough effort or we're not targeting our effort to those areas where we need to do better. And that, I guess, goes from whether we try to blanket the whole community or whether we look to um, more focused and targeted programs in relation um, to management of not only obesity but um, you know, other, other areas as well, such as smoking, for example. Um, we're, again, we're seeing improvements in some areas of the community and deterioration in others. But that work's under, underway. Sorry. Ms Breslin, the supplementary. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Minister, given much of government initiated debate about health care focuses on acute care when the main threats to life expectancies are in preventable chronic disease, what program funding is the government undertaking to address these issues beyond developing plans and strategies? Minister for Health. Um, well, in terms of, we have been putting more money into this area. I'll, I'll accept it's not enough in terms of where you look at the ratio. More goes into the acute system to deal with the current demands and it makes it difficult to allocate adequate resources into preventative health and health promotion areas. Uh, but we do have a fair bit of money going in there. Like in the health pact, um, health promotion grants alone is $2 million a year. Um, what I'm worried about is the, some of the money that um, we're putting in. I want to make sure that it's actually targeted into the right areas. Uh, and increasingly, I think we can see areas of disadvantage where health messages are not getting through, where they're not targeted uh, appropriately, um, you know, for one reason or another. And I think we need to seriously look at whether the two and five campaign, campaigns like that, which are very worthy and good, and you get a nice recipe book and, you know, the... Um, you know, the messages, people understand we need to eat two and five, but it's not actually translating into um, particular populations changing the way they um, eat and the way they exercise. And I think that's, that's the area I'd like to address first. But there will be more money into this area. Um, I'm not sure it'll be enough to satisfy you or indeed satisfy me, but there will be more money going into this area. And over time, I think you will see increasingly the shift away from acute into subacute and also into our health promotion and prevention activity. Yes, Ms Hunter. Minister, what socioeconomic groups are most likely to face high rates of obesity and chronic disease and how are you working to focus on them? Minister for Health. Yes, since I answer that, um, you know, I think in the ACT the areas where I would be most concerned are in the low socioeconomic groups um, and um, particularly and in Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander health. I think they're the two areas. And that's the question to me. I mean, when you run around the lake or, you know, at lunchtime, you know, you see a lot of fit Canberrans um, out exercising. Indeed, if you go around in the morning when Ms. Mr Speaker's racing around there, again, you see a lot of fit, healthy Canberrans. You don't see the people that perhaps we need to be targeting the message to the most. Uh, and that's, that's the issue, I think, that we need to have a pretty um, hard conversation about whether we now shift away from general sort of spray the population with the same message or whether we look at what resources we have available, pull it all together and actually make sure that, that, that those funds are going into the areas and the, into the population groups where we need to see substantial change. And I think... You know, in Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander health, we're not seeing the reductions in tobacco um, uh, that we tobacco consumption that we're seeing in other areas of the population. Uh, in young Aboriginal pregnant women, are still taking smoking up at a, a much higher rate than non non Aboriginal pregnant women. And so we need to, I think, instead of you know, in t for the next steps in tobacco control, look at how we are getting the messages to that population. So that is work that's currently underway. No easy answers, though, unfortunately. Yes, Ms Lakuda. Minister, has the ACT government adopted the World Health Organisation's social determinants of health framework as has been recommended? Uh, look, I'm certainly no... 
I'm not sure in terms of adopted. We're, I'm certainly aware of them and they're used in our policy development, um, but I will check as to whether we need to do anything else with them. Um, I know they certainly inform the discussions, but I, I've had a number of meetings with uh, the Chief Health Officer around this issue in the last four months or so because, as I said, I am increasingly concerned that whilst for many we're doing OK, there are, there are groups within our community where... Uh, the measures are going uh, are either s staying the same or going backwards, and I think we need to address that. Mr. Coe, question without notice. Mr. Speaker, and the question is to the Minister for Transport. Uh, Chief Minister, students and parents who wish to purchase a MyWay card are required to first apply and then register their details to obtain a card. This process requires parents and students to share details about the student, including name, school attended, date of birth, address, and telephone number. Chief Minister, given previous confidentiality failures overseen by the ACT government, will you guarantee that the information provided by MyWay Users to Action will be kept secure? Chief Minister. Uh, thank you, Mr Speaker, and I thank Mr Coe for the question. Uh, Mr, Mr Coe, I have to say that uh, no issues of concern have been raised with me in relation to a potential diminution of security in relation to information provided to action as a result of implementation of my way, but I accept that this is a very serious issue. I'm not aware of any potential for that to occur, but uh, on the basis of your question today, uh, I will take advice and seek assurances that uh, there will be no um, reduction uh, in our commitment to protecting confidential personal information. Mr Carr, supplementary. Uh, Chief Minister, is it true the photos and student details will be is it true the photos and student details will be sent interstate for printing of the cards? If so, how will you guarantee the security of the information provided by MyWay users? Chief Minister, thank you, um, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, I think um, just the, the process and whether or not uh, MyWay cards are processed within the ACT or interstate uh, isn't of itself, of course, relevant at all to. Uh, our capacity to secure uh, and to make and uh, to secure the confidentiality of that information. But as I said, Mr. Coe, it's a serious issue, and I'm more than happy to seek uh, the assurances uh, that you ask for today. And indeed, I would be more than happy, Mr. Coe, for you to be fully briefed by action uh, on the processes uh, that they have in place to ensure that uh, personal information provided to action for the uh, printing of my way cards is secure. Yes, Mr Smith. Um, Minister, what access will other agencies, both Territory and Commonwealth, have to the information provided by the MyWay users? Chief Minister. Uh, Mr Speaker, my understanding is they'll have none, but uh, I will take the question on notice. Oh, right, yes, Thank Mrs you. Dunn. Minister, Chief Minister, how could uh, sending photographs of potentially every school child in the ACT interstate not be a security risk? Chief Minister. Uh, thank you, Mr Speaker. Mr Speaker, what I said was that it would represent no greater risk to security uh, than uh, would uh, potentially exist in any event. But uh, uh, as I've indicated, I'll take the question on notice and I'll respond fully. And uh, I extend the offer of a briefing to... Uh, I, 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 well, if you're suggesting that it's uh, insecure interstate, you're suggesting that it's potentially insecure here. And if, uh, of course, I was uh, drawing the distinction that... Uh, the, uh, the place of uh, production, of course, should be relevant at all, and if it were, I would be most concerned. Uh, but I will seek the assurances that uh, members quite rightly are seeking in relation to this issue. That is Mr. Speaker. Yes, Mrs. Dunn. Minister, my question is to the Minister for Children and Young People. Minister, I take you back to your meetings with workers at Bimber Youth Justice Centre on the 24th of November 2010. It has been alleged on a number of occasions, both to me privately and also publicly through the media, that on, at one of those two meetings you at one point turned your body away from the meeting, covered your ears with your hands and said, la, 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 I don't want to know. You have repeatedly denied those allegations. Minister, I ask you once again for a simple yes-no answer. At one of those meetings with Bimbury workers on the 24th of November, did you at one point turn your body away from the meeting cover your ears and say, la, 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 I don't want to know. Careful, Joy. Minister Birch. Uh, no, Mr Speaker. Question, yes, Minister. Mrs Dunn. Mr. Mr Speaker. Minister, are you therefore accusing the people that have made these claims both to me privately and publicly through the media of lying about your behaviour at those meetings? Minister Birch. 
Um, no, I'm not, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Zelger, supplementary. Thank you, uh, Minister. In order to clear up this perception about your your behaviour on the 24th of November, will you now go again to Bimbury, meet with workers, listen carefully and sincerely to their concerns, and then act upon them decisively? Minister Birch. Um, I have been to Bimbury. I have listened to their concerns, and I've acted and responded to their concerns. Yes, Mr. Smith. Yeah, Minister. On reflection, um, what do you consider you could have done better at those meetings on the 24th of November in order to create a more positive perception about your behaviour at these meetings? Yeah. Minister Birch. Well, some feedback to me has been that that was a positive meeting, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Hargraves, question without notice. Uh, thanks very much, Mr. Speaker. My question is to the Minister for Housing. Um, and actually, in her capacity as Minister for Children and Young People, could you please uh, outline the range of activities in, uh, taking place in the. Mr. Hargraves. Thanks very much, Mr. Speaker. My question is to the Minister for Children and Young People. Minister, could you outline the range of. Members, can we please stop interjecting while Mr Hans Hargraves is trying to ask the question? It's really inappropriate. Thank you, Mr, Mr. Speaker. Speaker. Don't push it. Yes, but Mr Smith, clearly chatting amongst yourselves has a potential to be disorderly, which is against the standing orders. The volume at which the chatter is conducted is both inappropriate and unnecessary while Mr Hargraves is trying to ask a question. Mr Hargraves. Thanks very much, Mr Speaker. My question is to the Minister <coughs> of Children and Young People. Uh, Minister, could you outline the range of activities taking place in the ACT as part of National Youth Week, please? A celebration of young people. It's a great opportunity to recognise and celebrate young people's achievements and contribution to community. The week focuses on how optimistic, bold and vocal young people are with a full range of fun and diverse events. Throughout this week, young people have been actively taking part in celebrations. Mr Speaker, I launched the National Youth Week in the ACT for 2011 last Friday at the Youth Week Expo. It was great to see a broad range of youth related organisations present at the Expo. I acknowledge that Mr Coe and Ms, Ms Hunter was there in support of this fantastic week of events and the young people involved in them. This week is driven by young people, but everyone is encouraged to participate, young and old alike. This year, Youth Week celebrates the theme, Own It, which aims to encourage young people to embrace life, share ideas and to become involved in what young people are passionate about. National Youth Week is a fantastic opportunity for people to showcase their events, exchange ideas and act on issues that affect them. This year sees a range of innovative activities being run by young people, ranging from workshops, music festivals, competitions and opening and closing celebrations. There are 93 events taking place across the ACT up until Sunday 10 of April. There is still a lot happening and I encourage everyone to have a look at the National Youth Week website to see what's going on in their area. One of the events this weekend is the National Youth Week Festival, a fair with arts, which is a festival of youth visual art and live performance. The Canberra Youth Festival is performing hijinks, a youth variety spectacular, and the CYT Actors Ensemble will be running a theatre sports showdown. QL2 will stage a studio showing work of created by Melbourne choreographer Jodie Fagara and the performance will be part of QL2's major season identity in August of 2011. ACT Riders Centre and Canberra Contemporary Art Space will host the annual Zin Fair which includes Zins which I'm told are self-published magazines on art, badges, t-shirts, t-shirts, buttons, great designs as well as cupcakes. That's all happening from 12 this Saturday at our Gorman House. Youth Week is in the ACT is a partnership between the Department of Disability, Housing and Community Service and the Youth Coalition of the ACT. And I'd like to thank the Youth Coalition of the ACT for putting this fantastic event together. National Youth Week uh, would not be possible without their long-term and deep support for the young people in the Territory. The Department provides the Youth Coalition approximately $20,000 to coordinate National Youth Week and another $20,000 provided by the Australian Government grants to provide activities. This year, a total of 10 grants were provided to the ACT community to run events that give young people a chance to celebrate their achievements and to recognise the contribution of young people to our community. 
A number of grants are provided directly to the ACT schools to fund an event or activity initiated by students in AT schools or colleges. The aim of this funding is to give young people the opportunity to organise an event for their school or community. I'm pleased to also recognise the significant financial support provided by Beyond Blue for Youth Week. Youth Week in the ACT has received over $40,000 in sponsorships to conduct a week-long program in Jarvis Bay. Half of these funds were distributed to conduct a national Youth Week events focusing on Beyond Blue's key messages of look, listen, talk and seek help. Seek help. Mr Speaker, as you can see, Youth Week in the ACT is a strong community-based event delivered with and engaging with young people. This terrific range of activities and events highlight the diversity and achievements of young people in our community and are a credit to all those involved. Mr Hargraves, a supplementary. Thank you very much, Mr Speaker. The Minister, could you explain what has been organised for the Youth Interact Conference as part of National Youth Week, please? Minister Birch. Thank you, Mr Speaker, and thank Mr Hargraves. Uh, tomorrow I will be opening the Youth Interact Conference, which is being held in the Ainsley Arts Centre. The Youth Interact Conference is now in its 10th year and is hosted by ACT Youth Advisory Council and the support of the Department of Disability, Housing and Community Services. Conference participants are from a range of ages, abilities and backgrounds. As a result, the diverse views and thoughts of all young people in our community will be well represented and heard. The Youth Interact Conference aims to inform and engage young people in topical issues and fun activities, also while providing them with the opportunity to give valuable and insightful feedback to the ACT government on issues of importance for young people. Each year, the ACT Youth Advisory Council identifies forum topics for discussion. These topics are selected on the basis of their priority and based on feedback, which is received through an online survey which is conducted by the Youth Interact Consultation Register as well as feedback provided by the National Survey of Young Australians conducted by Mission Australia and in accordance with the priorities outlined in the Young People's Plan 2009-14. to For 2011 Interact Conference, the five topics will be addressed. Arrive Alive, Young Drivers and Passengers, Sustainability in the Environment, Alcohol Itself and Social Impact on Young People, Mental Health and Wellbeing, Removing the Stigma and Accessing Entertainment for Under-18s, Identifying the Barriers. Mr Speaker, a number of confidence building and recreational based workshops will also be conducted, such as circus skills, hip hop and funk dance, zumba dancing, stencil art, drama development workshop and unicycling. As well as participating in the conference, young people will be involved in the delivery of the actual conference through event management, catering, conference photography and assisting in generating positive media coverage over the event through partnerships with communities at work, Northside Community Services and Angler Care ACT. I look forward to hear about the outcomes of the conference tomorrow and the young people's ideas about these important issues. Mrs Dunn. Question. Uh, Minister, how much time and effort has been put in by your department to, uh, to secure media events for you during Youth Week? Minister Birch. Uh, this week is focused on the youth of the ACT. Yes, Ms Hunter. Uh, Order. Minister... Ms Hunter has the floor for a supplementary. Ms. Minister, how will you be using the feedback from the young people at the Youth Interact Conference? How will you be that feeding that back into uh, government decisions on policy programs and so forth? Minister Birch. Thank you, and I thank Ms Hunter for her question and recognise her involvement in the youth sector in uh, days of past before her arrival in this place. The Youth Interact Conference, when you look at those uh, five themes that they will be looking through, are all important themes for young Canberrans, and they're important that we hear what they have to say about it. Uh, there will be a formal write-up of the conference, but also the Youth Advisory Council will be bringing me first-hand a verbal report and a written report on those activities. And they will indeed work through uh, across my department areas where we can, but also inform uh, the, youth, uh, the youth plan implementation plans in the out years. Thank Chief you, Minister. Minister. Thank you, Mr Speaker. I ask further questions to be placed on notice paper. Mr Speaker, I seek leave to make a personal explanation under Standing Order 46. Yes, Mr Hargraves. Thank you very much, Mr Speaker. I thank members. Look, I refer to the, uh, the question from Mr Hanson today, and I believe that, in fact, the, uh, the Chamber is due an explanation. The issue about uh, the uh, Treasurer's return today <coughs> and uh, advice to the opposition of that return is the subject of this personal explanation. 
I had uh, communication from uh, Mr Hanson's office yesterday. Just, just settle, pedal. Settle, pedal. I had communication from Mr Hanson's office yesterday asking for the detail about the Ministerial Council, what time it starts and what day, etc., and quite a reasonable request that was. Uh, my office responded uh, that the meeting of States and Treasury Treasurers would uh, take place on Wednesday afternoon from four with no predict uh, a predetermined finish time, a standard arrangement whereby State and Treasuries meet prior to the MINCO to discuss and exchange views on the forthcoming agenda. Uh, that is where the States and Territories get together be without the Commonwealth to discuss these things. And the, Minister, and the MINCO itself commenced today, Thursday, at 9am and will be finished by COB that day. The MINCO is here in Canberra. There was an understanding in my office that the, the terminology finished by COB would mean an indeterminate time. Now, this is the bit that I wish the Chamber to know. I gave an instruction to my office to advise Mr Hanson's office this morning that should the Ministerial Council finish early, given that it was a Canberra, there was a likelihood that the Treasurer would return to the Chamber. That instruction from my office was not conveyed to Mr Hanson's office, and for that I give Mr Hanson an unqualified apology. It is my, my fault that, uh, that the information was not conveyed to, to the opposition. I'd also like the record to show, Mr Speaker, that I had no communication with the Greens on this issue either. So I hope that would, uh, would satisfy the Chamber as to what the circumstances really were. Thank you, Mr Hargrove's Treasurer. Mr Speaker, I also seek leave to make a statement, personal explanation, understanding Order 46. Yes, Treasurer. Uh, thank you. Just uh, further to Mr Hargrove's, um, may I offer my sincere apologies to the opposition that they came in here unprepared for question time or unprepared in the sense that they thought I wasn't going to be here and I was and I've obviously ruined the last hour for them and my most sincere apologies for that. <laughs> Mr. Mr Speaker, if I can make a yes, explanation as well. And I, I certainly would like to accept Mr Hargrove's apology and I appreciate that he's made that commitment. I think that the question that I asked that was ruled out of order was more about how was it that the Greens seemed to be informed when we didn't. And uh, I'm not trying to allege some sort of conspiracy here, but I think that, uh, you know, I, I accept your apology, uh, Mr Hargraves, but, uh, you know, Thanks. yours was given in a slightly different manner, uh, and I'll have to consider whether I'll accept that one or not. Mr Barr. We'll Thank you. Order. Thank, Thank you. you, Mr Barr. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Order. Order. Thank you, members. Mr Barr has the floor now. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Last week in question time, Ms Bresnan asked me several questions about the length of rural leases in the Nars Valley in the context of the ACT's water security plans and ACTU's planning for a possible... NACE. Oh, NACE. Sorry, NACE Valley, yes. Uh, for a possible tenant dam. Uh, ACTU advises me that, they are very un that it is very unlikely that they would require the land in the immediate future. The corporation has advised that the enlarged Cotter Dam and Murrumbidgee to Googong water transfer projects are scheduled for completion in mid-2012 and with the Tantangra transfer project are expected to provide water security for the foreseeable future based on current modelling. However, Mr. Mr Speaker, ACTU advises that they continue to review their operations for water security into the future, and they are specifically examining the question of any longer-term use of the land for water storage and will report to government shortly. Uh, Ms Hunter and Ms Lacuda asked supplementary questions about the hydrology of the site and its suitability for water storage and what plans ACPLA had for the area and what uh, what information ACPLA had on the ecological qualities of the area and the viability of the site for such development. As I noted in my response at that time, these are matters that are really uh, in the purview of other agencies, but I can uh, advise that ACPLA itself has no plans for the valley. Thank you. 